Welcome back to the introduction to mind and will. Today we're going to be talking about dualism. Our readings both come from Descartes, two different pieces. Some selections from the meditations, other selections from the passions of the soul. All right, let's jump right in. Okay, so remember last time we talked about Nagel, who argued that you know the mind can't really be understood in exactly the same way the body can. We can't really give a like neurochemical explanation of all of the things that the mind does. In other words, we can't give a purely physical explanation of the mind because it seems like some things would go missing, right? We would get some things wrong. What will we get wrong? What would be missing? Well, the quality of some of the experiences that we have. Remember the chocolate bar, right? You taste the chocolate bar. What is the taste of the chocolate bar? Can that be found in the brain, right? Can a uh, external person, a third party, look in your brain and find the taste of chocolate? Nagel thinks no, right? Nagel thinks no, and because of that, no purely physical explanation is ever going to fully do the job of capturing what it is to taste the chocolate, right? So there's something about the mental that a purely physical explanation would not get. Nagel's solution then was to say that the brain has both mental and physical properties, right? It's got a mental and physical aspects. Remember, we call this the dual aspect theory. In other words, there really is something going on in the brain when we eat chocolate that explains the taste, right? So it does have to do with the brain. It's just that our attempt to give that a physical explanation is always going to fail. Right? It has to be a mental explanation because it's a mental phenomena. This week we're going to talk about substance dualism. Substance dualism might, it, it, like on a surface level, seem to have some kind of similarity with the view that Nagel was expressing. But that's really just surface level similarity. Right? A substance dualist, for example, is going to agree with Nagel that yes, a physical explanation, like a purely physical explanation of mental phenomena, is going to get it wrong. But it's not going to get it wrong just because it's missing some property of the brain uh, that ought to be included, like some mental property. It's going to get it wrong, the substance dualist says, because the mind is not physical, right? The mind has nothing to do with the physical in terms of its being. Right, so the mind is not the brain for a substance dualist. Okay, uh, the person we're going to look at to kind of get us a, an idea of this view uh, is Rene Descartes. Right, here's a quote: "In order to seek truth, it is necessary once in the course of our life to doubt as far as possible of all things." This comes from the preface to the Meditations. Right now, it doesn't really seem to do much with the philosophy of mind, right? Telling us how the mind and the body relate. It doesn't really seem to have much uh, relation. But you'll soon see how we get there. Okay. So because I'm not asking you to read all the meditations, since it's fairly long and somewhat difficult to read, uh, let me start by giving you something of a loose introduction to the work. Okay. So Descartes, first of all, is probably the most influential modern philosopher, uh, at least where philosophy of mind is concerned. Now, modern philosophy does not mean contemporary philosophy. Right? Modern philosophy is like 17th to 19th century. Okay, So in that period, he's probably the most influential philosopher, certainly the most influential where the philosophy of mind is concerned. All right. Uh, meditation on the first philosophy is his most famous writing and in the meditations his job the thing that he sets his his sight on is rebuilding all of human knowledge from the bottom up pretty big task right uh, so as a preface to this Descartes tells us that uh, in growing up and becoming older he has realized how many of the beliefs he had held throughout his life you know since he was a child ended up being false, right? Some of these he didn't discover for quite some time. He labored under these false beliefs for a while. And this has become sort of distressing to him, right? If that has happened previously many times, Descartes' uh, mind is, or Descartes thinks rather, uh, it could happen again, 
right? I could be wrong about many of the things that I believe right now. And I only want to believe in true things. So what am I going to do about this? Well, <laughs> Descartes' solution, pretty radical, is to start over, right? He is going to dismiss everything he's been taught by his teachers, by his parents, the community. He's going to uh, go back to zero, right? And he's going to try to rebuild all of human knowledge from certain foundations. Certain meaning not doubtable, right? So he wants to build up knowledge from this firm ground from which he can get everything else, right? Okay. How is he going to do that? Well, he's going to go about testing all of these beliefs with doubt. So if he can doubt it, it's not certain, and it's not going to work as a foundation. So he's going to get rid of it. He's going to choose, at least for the moment, not to believe in it. That's the idea. The idea, then, is not skepticism. right? Descartes is not here trying to become a skeptic or trying to encourage skepticism. Instead, he's using it as a tool to get us these firm foundations that we can build upon. Okay, a bit more on the meditations. In subjecting everything to this radical form of doubt, you know, it's, it's a very radical form of doubt because it's, it entertains the notion that if it's doubtable at all, if a belief is doubtable at all, regardless of that level of doubt, you have to get rid of it, right? It's pretty extreme. Uh, doing this, he finds that there's only one thing that survives, at least to start. And that is the notion that he himself exists. That's it, right? I exist. That's the only thing he gets to. You might have heard of cogito ergo sum before, right? I think, therefore I am. Okay. Again, he arrives at this, this radical conclusion that the only thing he can know for sure is that he exists because he's subjecting his beliefs to that extreme form of doubt, right? That extreme form of doubt. How he gets there and like the specifics, the ways in which he doubts, it's very interesting. Highly recommend checking it out if you'd like. The meditations is free everywhere on the internet. Okay. Uh, one example really quickly looks like I'm giving here. Uh, <laughs> it's called the dreaming hypothesis, right? Uh, Descartes uses the dreaming hypothesis to doubt uh, knowledge from the senses, right? Knowledge that we can gain through experiencing the world around us, right? So Descartes' idea is pretty simple. It goes like this. Uh, if it's possible that dreams could resemble real life or the waking world, however you want to call it, uh, then it's possible then instead of experiencing something real right now when I look out or even touch my computer screen, I'm actually just dreaming it, right? Yikes. Well, if I'm actually just dreaming it, it's not true, right? Dreams aren't veridical. Dreams don't tell me what's true, which means all of the things that I think I know because I experience them, well, they're not certain, right? They can be doubted. How can they be doubted? I might be dreaming. Right? So you can see how radical this form of doubt is. Right? If, if he can find any way at all to subject something to doubt, he's going to get rid of it. Why? Because it, it can't be a certain firm foundation. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of how Descartes doing this uh, radical doubt project. Okay, more on the meditations. Specifically, how does this get us to a view of mind? Right. Interesting so far, but that's epistemology, right? the study of knowledge. That doesn't really tell us anything about the mind just yet. Well, Descartes thinks that, um, uh, again, we know we exist, but not just that we exist, that we exist as thinking things, right? Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Some other people like to say, I doubt therefore I am, right? It's the fact that I can do this doubting, that I can subject all of these things to this rigorous test of doubt, that I know I exist. Why? Because there has to be something doing the doubting. Something has to be doing the thinking. That leads Descartes to the notion that what I am at my core is a thinking thing. What I am at my core is a doubting, a thinking, a believing thing. Okay, 
All right, so now we're starting to get more towards the mind, right? What are you principally? A thinking thing for Descartes. Okay, so Descartes is certain that he exists in some form, despite the fact that he can't be certain about the world around him, right? That's the dreaming hypothesis. For Descartes, this means that the mind is not dependent on the notion of external existence. Big, right? Descartes has gotten us to existence, but only mental existence. The idea that you have a body extended in space, right? Taking up space that has mass, right? That can still be doubted. We don't need that in order to, you know, think of ourselves as thinking things. Maybe you're a thinking thing with no body at all, right? Possible. And because that's possible, we can't accept that a body is just a matter of fact, right? We don't get that with certainty. This leads Descartes to believe that, like, the true essence of a mind is not attached to a body at all. It's separate. It's its own thing, right? Okay. Uh, kind of like jumping forward into the meditations just to give you like a snapshot of what he ends up doing. Uh, he ultimately thinks that we can rebuild all of human knowledge. We can learn stuff about the body too, not just the mind, right? Uh, and the world around us at large. Eventually, he thinks that uh, once you include a proof for God, right? He, he goes on from Kajurego Sum, proving that we exist, to proving that God exists, and that because God exists in a certain way, God has to be good, right? God is all good and would not deceive us about certain things. All of these other things have to fall in line. We're not going to spend much time on that. That's but that's the meditations project at large, right? For us, we're concerned about this this cleaving apart the concept of the mind and the body, right? This is one of the first times noted in Western philosophy that we start to see this like distinction being driven home between the mind and the body, right? Okay. Uh, Descartes doesn't stop there, though, right? He doesn't just say, yeah, we're a mind. You know, our, our, our uh, most, like, core existence is mental, and therefore that's all we are. If he did that, he would not be a dualist. He would be what we call an idealist. Right? Idealism, which we're not really going to spend much time discussing in this, cl in this class, is just the view that the only kinds of things there are are mental things right that's the only kind of stuff that exists so you've heard me talk about physicalism thus far right physicalism is the view that the only things that exist are physical idealism is exactly the opposite right so no there are no physical things the only things that exist are mental there's no bodies there's no physical matter at all right he's not an idealist he's a substance dualist what does that mean and why okay so we have a mind, we have a brain, but what are their natures? Well, Descartes thinks both do exist, right? But they are separate and distinct. In fact, he says that they're different substances. He rarely talks about brains until later, but we're going to use brain and body kind of interchangeably here, okay? Um, so he thinks these two things are different substances. Well, what is a substance? In philosophy, especially today, we use the word substance to refer to a thing's like most basic nature, what its fundamental nature is. So, for example, if you were to ask, well, what is everything made of? You're asking about substance, right? Some philosophers, like physicalists, for example, believe there's only one substance, physical matter, right? Whatever physics says. Others, like Descartes, believe that there are more. There's more than one substance, right? There's two. Um, there's two. Okay. So Descartes has this additional kind of quirky way of dealing with substance. Uh, he thinks that we can figure out which things are substances by tracing how dependent they are on other concepts. Right? So if a thing does not require anything else for its existence or for our understanding of it, Descartes thinks it's independent, right? It gets to count as its own substance. Therefore, because we can think of the mind as being separate, 
Like when we were going through that process of radical doubt along with Descartes, we could think of ourselves as thinking things without necessarily thinking our thinking of ourselves as things with bodies. The two have to be different. Right? That's that's the move Descartes making. Here's a quote. There's a great difference between the mind and the body, inasmuch as the body is by its very nature always divisible, while the mind is utterly indivisible. For when I divisible, indivisible, just meaning you can cut up, you can take apart, right? So he's suggesting that the mind can be take uh, the body can be taken apart, right? But the mind cannot be. For when I consider the mind or myself, insofar as I am merely a thinking thing, I am unable to distinguish any parts within myself. I understand myself to be something quite single and complete. By contrast, there is no corporeal or extended thing that I can think of, which in my thought I cannot easily divide into parts. And this very fact makes me understand that it is divisible. This one argument would be enough to show me that the mind is completely different from the body. Okay, so this is his first. Uh, this argument comes later in the meditations. This is meditations. Uh, looks like it should be six. Yeah, meditation six. Uh, so at the very end of the book, uh, where he's telling us, look, I really only need this one argument to show you that these two things are not the same. Uh, the mind is a whole, right? I have thoughts. And I can't even conceive of taking those thoughts apart, separating them into parts. What would that even be like? Or the, the taste of chocolate, to think back to Nagel. Can you imagine taking the taste of chocolate and dividing it? Descartes says, no, that's not a thing that we can even imagine being done. But the body are things that are extended. To be extended just means to take up space, right? These things... It's pretty obvious how they can be divided. We can imagine them being divided into parts, right? So this shows, according to Descartes, there are obviously different things. One can be divided, the other can't be. One is necessarily a whole, the other can be broken into parts, right? He has more to say, though. Okay. Two distinct substances. Thus, because we can't conceive of the mind being divisible in the way we know the body is, Descartes thinks they can't be identical. We got that. Further, when we went through the process of cogito ergo sum, right, finding that we exist despite employing this radical doubt against everything else, Descartes, as I said earlier, conceived of himself as a thinking thing, not anything else, just a thinking thing, right? I think, therefore, I exist, not... I live, I breathe, I eat, I sleep, therefore I exist, right? I think, therefore I exist. In other words, while Descartes could not doubt his existence as a purely thinking thing, it took a lot more work through the meditations to build back up to a body, right? And for him, that means these two things are independent substances. They don't rely on one another conceptually for their existence. Okay, Okay. so because of their separate forms of existence, it is also the case that the mind can exist without the body, right? Descartes comes from the Catholic tradition, right? So he wants this to be the case for a variety of reasons. The mind can exist without the body. In fact, he calls the mind the soul quite a bit. Uh, and the body without the mind, he gives the example of like a corpse, right? It's a body, but there's no mind there. Seems like the mind has, to use his language, escaped right earlier in the meditations we get another argument for thinking that the mind and body are distinct okay but it's a bit tricky it's a bit tricky so we're going to go through the example he gives uh, uh to try and understand for ourselves okay uh, before we get to the example the basic idea is just that the mind and the body have different faculties a faculty is just like a a uh, ability an ability that a thing has so where the mind has the ability or the faculty to think and to feel like passion uh, and to exude a will and things like that to have imagination the body does not rather the body has faculties like sensation right uh, it can sense touch it can see it can taste it can smell it can hear right it does these things it feels pain right uh, so they have different faculties and therefore they are altogether different 
right? Uh, the mind can never the mind can never smell, right? The mind can never taste, but the physical body can never think, can never imagine, right? He gives us an example to try and show us that this is the case. It's called the wax example, and it's pretty famous for a variety of reasons. Uh, we're gonna take the quote first, and then we're gonna explain it. Let us take, for example, this piece of wax. It has been taken quite freshly from the hive, and it has not yet lost the sweetness of the honey which it contains. It still retains somewhat of the odor of the flowers from which it has been culled. Its color, its figure, its size are apparent. It is hard, cold, easily handled, and if you strike it with the finger, it will emit a sound. Finally, all the things which are requisite to cause us distinctly to recognize a body are met within it. But notice that while I speak and approach the fire, what remained of the taste is exhaled. The smell evaporates. The color alters. The figure is destroyed. The size increases. It becomes liquid. It heats. Scarcely can one handle it. And when one strikes it, no sound is emitted. Does the same wax remain after this change? We must confess that it remains. None would judge otherwise. What then did I know so distinctly in this piece of wax? It could certainly be nothing of all that the senses brought to my notice, since all these things which fall under taste, smell, sight, touch, and hearing are found to be changed. And yet the same wax remains. Perhaps it was what I now think, that is, that this wax was not that sweetness of honey, nor that agreeable scent of flowers, nor that particular whiteness, nor that figure, nor that sound, but simply a body which a little while before appeared to me as if perceptible under these forms, and which is now perceptible under others. But what precisely is it that I imagine when I form such conceptions? Let us attentively consider this, and abstracting from all that does not belong to the wax, let us see what remains. Certainly nothing remains excepting a certain extended thing which is flexible and movable. Okay, long quote. What do we get out of it? You have this piece of wax, right? It has a certain smell, a certain taste. When you thump it, it sounds a certain way. It has a certain feel to it. All of these things Descartes trying to get, get at are physical attributes, right? They're all physical attributes. These are the things that our body can tell us about. So all of this information about the candle is coming to us through the body, right? Coming to us through the body. But those things can change, right? When we take those things in front of a fire, right? We heat the wax up. All of those things change. It loses its taste. It loses its taste. It loses the smell. Its form changes. It's not the same thing anymore. Right? It doesn't appear to be the same thing anymore. But we know that it is. We know that it is the same wax. How can that be the case? Well, Descartes says, the mind tells you that that's the case. Right? The mind tells you that that's the case. It's a judgment that you're making. Right? So all of the information that the body can give you is telling you this is no longer the same. Taste touch, smell, all of it. But the mind is still able to tell you it's one and the same piece of wax, okay? So that's the move. That's more or less the move. They have different faculties, different ways of apprehending the world. They're separate. <laughs> that's, that's the whole move. Okay, to drive the point home, Descartes says, we say that we see the wax itself if it is there before us, not that we judge it to be there from its color or shape. And this might lead me to conclude without more ado that knowledge of the wax comes from what the eyes see and not from the scrutiny of the mind alone. Okay, so he's suggesting, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we are gaining knowledge about the wax just by looking at it, right? Just through the senses, stuff that the body can do. But then if I look out of the window and see men crossing the square as I just happened to have done, I normally say that I see them in themselves, just as I say that I see the wax. Okay, so you can imagine looking out your window, you see men in coats and a hat walking by, right? So you conclude there are men walking by. Yet do I see any more than hats and coats which could conceal automatons? <laughs> okay, so maybe those weren't men, 
they were robots, right? They just happened to be, they were wearing coats and hats, right? Um, not men. In other words, your senses tell you one thing, right? Your judgment, another, right? Your senses don't have the ability to tell you, oh, these are men. They just tell you, look, there's hats and coats moving about in certain ways. And it is your mind that creates the judgment that those are men walking, right? That's what Descartes trying trying to do. That's what he was trying to do with the wax as well. The mind is required to tell you this is the same piece of wax because the body can't do it, right? The body can just deliver the raw, like, sense experience. Okay. And so something which I thought I was seeing with my eyes is in fact grasped solely by the faculty of judgment which is in my mind. So the mind and the body are distinct for Descartes, right? So the mind is responsible for drawing conclusions about the information that the body sends it. Uh, and because these two things perform different functions, the mind and the body, they seem to be conceptually distinct. And remember, for Descartes, that means they are different substances, okay? That plus the argument that one of them is necessarily extended, right? The body has to take up space. It can be uh, segmented, taken apart. Whereas the mind seems completely indivisible, can't be taken apart, leads Descartes to the conclusion the mind and the body are two different things. Not like Nagel, who suggested they're the same thing, it's just there's mental and physical properties. No, these are two entirely different things that come together, right? They come together to work together, but they're two different things. Okay, that only answers the first part of our question we've been occupied with, though. What is the mind, right? We still want an answer to the further question, how does the mind relate to the body, right? That's the mind-body problem. How does Descartes answer this? Well, he tries to give us an account in The Passions of the Soul, our second reading for today. All right, very quickly then, Passions of the Soul. Um, in this, he attempts to describe all of the faculties that the soul has, right? It's very long. It's very specific. We only are going to read a like, few selections, like maybe a couple pages from this, um, and how it relates to the body. Here, we're really just concerned with the latter thing, right? How the mind relates to the body. Again, mind and soul for Descartes, for these purposes, more or less the same thing. Okay. Uh, the first interesting thing he points out is that because the soul or the mind has to be indivisible, right? It's not, it's not in space. It doesn't take up space, so it's not divisible. Uh, however, it ends up being connected to the body it needs to be connected to the whole of the body rather than just one part. Why? Well, it's interesting. He, re he remarks that we can lose limbs, right? We can, like small parts of ourselves, we can lose in terms of our bodies, right? But the mind remains. The mind remains. And therefore, the mind can't be in just one part, right? It has to be unified with the whole of the body. It's also the case that the mind is supposed to be able to deliver like signals or deliver instructions to all of the things, right? So it can't just be in one place, right? So that idea of linking up the mind just to the brain is not quite going to work for Descartes. Okay. But how does this work then? Well, Descartes in his time was under tremendous pressure <laughs> to explain how exactly this works. And so he does his best to give a story, okay? But it is just a story. Um, so Descartes, uh, you know, he did a lot of work in anatomy. He was a scientist as well as a philosopher. He thinks that there's these nerves, right, that run all throughout the body. And ultimately, all of them terminate in the brain, right? That they all centrally terminate in the brain. Specifically, he thinks at the center of the brain where there is a gland, uh, now we call this gland the pineal gland. Okay, he, there, uh, there wasn't a name for it at that time. Uh, or at least not one that Descartes mentions, and certainly not the pineal gland. Um, he thinks that signals are sent from all the appendages. So if you stub your toe, a signal goes from that nerve all the way up into your brain to the pineal gland. And that that physical information about the body 
is then delivered to the mind or the soul. The pineal gland does the delivering, right? Also works the other way, right? So the mind or the soul can send instructions through the pineal gland down into those nerves to your extremities, right? It can send commands so that your your body takes actions. Yeah. Okay. So this makes Descartes what we call an interactionist. He thinks that the mind interacts with the body and vice versa. Right? So they are two separate things, but they do interact with one another. The mind sort of gives instructions to the body, but the body gives sensory information and information about you know the the status of the of the body to the mind yeah uh, that's interactionism yeah there are other kinds of substance dualism like occasionalism for example or parallelism that are extremely unpopular I'd say to the extent that we, we probably aren't really going to discuss them in here uh, so, so for example parallelism is the idea that yes the mind and the body are two distinct things, but they do not ever interact, right? The mind just does what it does, and the body just does what it does, and it just so happens that they do these things in parallel, right? So when the body, right, when you stub your toe, when you physically stub your toe, right, it is the case that you experience pain mentally, but there's no connection between these two events, right? There's really no connection at all. Some parallelists say it's just by coincidence. That's not really defensible. Others say it's because God arranges the events to be to, to make sense to us. But there is no cause and effect there, right? The interactionist, which is a much, much, much more common form of substance dualism, holds that no, there really is cause and effect between the mind and the body, uh, downstream and upstream, right? Okay, uh, even though it's the most common form of substance dualism, there's a lot of objections that come as a result of this notion of interaction, right? We're going to see some of those next time. So summing up, Descartes thinks that we should believe that the mind and the body are entirely distinct things. One is purely thinking and doesn't seem to be physical in any sense. It doesn't seem like we can cut it up. It doesn't seem to be extended in space. It seems to have different faculties. The other, by necessity, is extended in space, right? A body, in being a physical thing, needs to be extended in space and is capable of interacting with the physical world. That's more or less Descartes' view, right? So note again, while there's some similarities for Nagel here, right? For example, Descartes and Nagel both agree purely physical explanations are not going to be good enough to explain something like the taste of chocolate. This is a drastically different view than Nagel's. Descartes thinks the mind is something entirely different from the body, certainly not just another aspect of the brain. But the plausibility of this view of substance dualism largely rests on how we're going to explain how the mind interacts with the brain at all or interacts with the body more generally right descartes tries to give us a story and his passions of the soul but it's it's fairly minimal right and it's it's more of a suggestion right oh well it happens in the pineal gland okay well that doesn't really answer the philosophical questions we have as to how these two things can interact those questions the questions having to do with how these two different substances can interact uh we largely get from uh, one of his students, one of his most famous students called, the, called Princess Elizabeth, right? Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. Uh, so next time, we're going to look at Princess Elizabeth's objection to Descartes and see whether or not substance dualis, dualism and Descartes' substance dualism more specifically can handle it. Uh, until then, uh, stay healthy and stay safe.